I don't know what's wrong with me. Like, I was watching this episode and it just felt like it was dragging for some reason. And I'm not sure why. It's not a bad episode. It's got good acting. It's got an engaging story. You know, it's it's got a lot of good hallmarks. But I remember at one point in the episode, just basically being like, "Man, I must almost be at the end by now, right?" And I looked down and I, I wasn't even at the halfway point in the episode. And my reaction was basically, "Really? Really? That's it? Okay, okay, whatever." I, I only bring this up because I'm curious if anyone else had a similar experience when watching this one. So. I'm only going to mention this in brief uh, as a curiosity. For those of you curious, uh, this episode was actually done after the next episode, but the next episode had been converted into a two-parter very late into production, as I'll discuss next week. Uh, so this episode actually happened before the next one, and uh, just bringing it up, there's some weird issues that happened as a consequence of that. I also want to mention, it was actually really great that they managed to get the actress who played Jennifer back. I don't remember if this is the last time she shows up on the show, but I know it's among the last time she shows up on the show. And it was actually a decent way for, for Star Trek to go ahead and have the actress and the character continue in their own uh, particular idiom, since, you know, she's mega dead back in, back in our timeline. Like, there's no possibility of assimilation here. She was based, She was dead before the ship exploded, and then the ship exploded, so, you know. Well, that brings me up to, to two questions. First of all, what the hell are mere Borg like? Second of all, <clears throat> maybe they call themselves the cooperative. Second of all, I find myself wondering, I've already mentioned how the nature of the mirror universe is ludicrous. And I've, I feel like I've already given my, my credits on that. I don't really need to repeat it. But the fact that Benjamin Sisko exists in both universes and Jennifer exists in both in both universes, and that they got married in both universes, that is stretching credulity to such an insane degree I can't even wrap my head around it properly. I, I look at that like, really? Really? It just goes back to my earlier theory, that this is a crafted universe, that there is something or someone with sufficient power or advancement to be able to basically guide it in a path so that it it basically forms a mimicked universe. Because that would make more sense to me than things just happen to line up the same way despite wildly divergent timelines. Although there is a theory in real life that, that would kind of help to posit that, but I'm not going to cover that right now, so moving on. There's a bit where Smiley shows up, and he pulls a gun on Cisco and is like, Hey... And Cisco's like, no, no, I'm going to go along with this. I found that interesting. Oh, excuse me. I found that interesting that he just went along with it because that's actually incredibly dangerous. Now, obviously, Cisco isn't that important yet. So it's within the realm of reason to not be that suspicious of someone insisting you beam out with them. But it would have been extremely easy if Cisco was significantly more important for some strange reason, like he becomes later in uh, DS9, in order to be assassinated in such a method. Because if you think about it, the transporter is probably the perfect assassination weapon. Like, so perfect it's actually scary, especially since they basically never use it for that. Even ignoring the fact that you can just beam them out into space... You could also beam them out into composite particles, into a cloud. You could never beam them out. You could beam them into a wall. A lot of these things I just mentioned actually happen in Star Trek, just usually on accident. <laughs> Anyways, I'm just food for thought. I'm just surprised. Um, it's also not surprising to me, though, that Obra excuse me, Smiley would actually be able to come up with a way to artificially cre recreate the transporter incident because it's freaking Smiley. Like I know that sounds strange, but of all the people I could see f figuring that out on the other side, it would be him. This is especially important since near as I can tell, he came up with the plan on his own. He didn't inform anyone of it. None of their inner circle was actually informed of this. So, <clears throat> um, Cisco is the leader of the rebellion. Now... Smiley mentions that the only reason the Rebellion's doing as well as they have is because Sisko was in charge of Captain Sisko was in charge of it. And then they mention multiple times that he's good in a fight and wants to fight and is... but is bad at leadership. And in fact, is mentioned to have qualities that would imply poor char charisma. That he can't actually lead. That all he can do is charge and other people happen to follow in his wake. Now, that might have been nice to get things started, but I find myself wondering how, how the Rebellion's doing well at all if that's the circumstance. 
In hindsight, however, that makes perfect sense because it would explain why the Rebellion isn't doing so well. In fact, as has been posited by some people, uh, theory crafters over the years, the Rebellion should have done a lot more damage and gotten a lot farther than it currently has within a year's time based on the circumstances as we know them, but bad leadership would keep them back from that. Now that they have good leadership with Smiley and Jennifer in charge, well, maybe they'll actually be able to accomplish something. Um, Tuvok was there. That was actually pretty great. I liked the inclusion of Tuvok. I, it was a very deliberate and intentional thing. That is Tim Russ. That is Tuvok. They're in the Badlands. You know, it's just a little thing, and I liked it. And I, I just wanted to comment on that real quick. I also like Rom being sufficiently pissed about Quark. It's a nice little touch that they throw in there because, as weird as this sounds, there's like a typical mystery in this episode that's so irrelevant that it almost doesn't matter. Like, uh, the implication is that someone betrayed them. And so, and they po- approach this in a completely textbook standard method. They have Bashir, who is the, ha ha, I'm, you know, I'm completely obstinate, and I'm arguing with you in every path. But he's actually loyal. And then they have Rom, who's like, I'm really loyal, but I'm actually the traitor. The only subtle thing they do is that Rom was not actually the traitor. Rom was just doing this as part of their plan. Which is admittedly a nice little twist, and would make more sense given what we know about the characters. Uh, I also like how Bashir basically tries to take over the rebellion with no plan in mind. Again, getting back to my point of how the rebellion kind of sucks without you know actual leadership and coordination. Actual leadership and coordination can work wonders, uh, and real life history will show that a th- bajillion times, roughly. Yes, that's a th- bajillion for anybody who wants to write that down. So, when Avery Brooks got the script for this episode, the teleplay, I should be more accurate, uh, he mentioned how he likes it because his character gets to have sex twice in this episode. Now, I I feel like that's a joke, (laughs) but I gotta be honest, this is a really weird situation. So, I want you to imagine for a moment that there's someone you respect and have respected for years and years and years, probably decades actually, as your friend. And they happen to currently be in the body of an attractive gender you're interested in. And then you are in a weird situation where they're basically demanding that you have sex with them. (laughs) That is so many levels of awkward and weird. I gotta be completely honest, I don't think I could have done that. I know that sounds strange. I mean, no offense to Terry Farrell, she's an extremely attractive woman. That's not the point. The point is that if I was Cisco, there would be literally zero attraction there. Actually, probably negative attraction there, as I like to think of it. And so it would be like, okay, yeah, sure. Um, Maybe later? (laughs) Like, do I need to do this to stay in character? Is this mandatory to be in character? It could be argued to be necessary, because then she might try to oust him as not really Cisco, and blah, blah, blah. And yet, I cannot help but point out that of the two women who are... Three, actually, sorry, three women who are intimately familiar with Captain Cisco... It is Jennifer, the woman who hasn't talked to him in years, who figures out that he is not Captain Sisko. Now, I have my own theories as to why that is, but my point is, did he really need to stay in character for that? Like, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I can't really think in that direction. But then again, I am admittedly a self-admitted prude, and I don't think of things like that. But that would just be awkward and weird and no... I mean, even if you're, you agree to it, there would be no turn on in this. So it's just like, honey, aren't you into this? Yeah, this is great. You know, <laughs> I'm sorry. My mind's really on the battle and oh, I barely survived. You know, just talk your way out of it. Come on, Cisco. Anyways. So I also find it funny how much it takes for Cisco to punch someone. Like, he has to, he, he's like, he's thinking about how to talk his way through this. And Smiley's over, he's like, you need to punch him. Come on, go punch him. It's what he needs to do, punch him. And then he takes him on another one, and then he finally punches him. Now, I find that funny because anyone familiar with Cisco in later DS9 knows that Cisco has this really weird habit of punching people. I know that sounds like a weird thing, but it's like his shtick, right? Like, <clears throat> so Kirk's shtick was, was the... Kirk, exaggerated speech thing, which he actually didn't do all that much. But, you know, that's that's what he kind of got known for is his shtick, right? And, of course, talking a computer to death. Um, Picard, the Picard speech. You know, very, very obvious one there. Um, Janeway, other than changing her hair all the time, she has this thing where she would project strength, right? Like, she would always refuse to negotiate, refuse to work with you. Just, this is what's happening, the end. And then we have Cisco, whose thing is punching people. 
So it's funny to me how much it took him to convince him to punch Bashir. I'm thinking, like, if this happened a season or two later, he'd just be like, Bashir would be like, oh, I don't think we should do this. Bam! Dude, I was just going to give it a suggestion. Jesus. <gasps> Anyways. <clears throat> and I also like how Smiley is still smart in the alternate reality. He's pretty much, as, as Cisco points out, he's the only one using his brains. One of the things that's been very true in war in much of human history, but even recently, uh, as in within the last century, is how valuable it is to get the scientists of the other side onto yours. And as they talk about it, Jennifer is a very brilliant scientist. She, she, the way they treat her is basically as uh, one of the Einstein group. You know what I'm talking about. Um, the group of German scientists and Jewish scientists and otherwise uh, Austrian scientists, you know, who were pulled over during World War II to the Alliance, to the Allied side. And I'm kind of with that. I, I wish it was more than just her. It would make more sense. But still, you know, it's, it's a nice building block. Um, which brings me to my next point. This is another thing I wanted to mention. So over on the other side, uh, Kira is all flustered and frustrated. And Garak's all stupid. He's really stupid in this continuity. And Kira says, execute those three people. Why? Random executions will convince people to work better. Now, see, here's an interesting thing, and I actually talked about this recently in my Clone Wars Mini Nations, uh, which by this point will have gone live like four months ago, but I was just recording that this week. I, it's, it's a TV show. I, you know how it works. Anyways, um, <laughs> I mean, I'm a TV show. In order to uh, convince someone to do something, there's... I, I like to think of it as a a bubble, okay? You can push out of that bubble, and it will it will bend a significant way, but if you push too hard, it'll snap, right? Now, this applies to a lot of different things, but in this case, it's how much people are willing to put up with. So, if the consequences for rebelling become equal to or less bad than the consequences of submission, the likelihood of open rebellion increases exponentially. I mean, that's just basic logic, never mind the fact that that is historically proven many, many times. If you... And that's what this random execution thing just real means to me. This is another one of the reasons why so many people have debated the, the power of the Alliance um, over the years, is, is how frankly stupid, let's just put it how that, let's just put it that way, they are about how they oppress those underneath them effectively pushing them into rebellion, practically deliberately. Never mind the fact that they go out of the way to show Kira wallowing in opulence at every opportunity. <laughs> Let's just ignore that. Anyways, so, you know, Rom's a traitor. Da -da -da -da. I do like how, once again, just like the last episode we had over in DCS9, everyone's not the evil version of themselves, as will be uh, sometimes I've referred to when it comes to the mirror universe. It's just a nice little touch, and I kind of like that. I wanted to mention that really quick. Uh, Smiley's probably the best example of this. He is surprisingly decent of a person, despite being the mirror universe version of himself, etc., etc. So, Cisco gets kidnapped. <laughs> and then Cisco proves why he has the second biggest balls in Starfleet, only surpassed by Worf. Because first thing he does is he sees Kira and immediately grabs her face and kisses her. I actually felt bad for not a visitor because you can hear see her just kind of being like, <laughs> but at the same time, that's in character because I'm sure uh, in Intendant Kira is having the same reaction. Whoa! Oh, this is exactly what I wanted. And he plays her perfectly. He, when I say he plays her, I mean he, he, he plays her like a fiddle. He, he has got her completely on strings and he does it exactly how he needs to. Just enough to get him the kind of leeway he needs to accomplish his mission. And no more. That means he has to have sex with her. <sighs> I'm not even going to get into that. I'm not. <laughs> Again, Nana Visitor is an attractive woman. That's not the point. <laughs> How much is the mission worth to you, man? But either way, he does actually manage to convince her. And just pretty much immediately turns her against Garak. And that's the best part, because he, he does it quite, quite brilliantly, honestly. His approach of trying to ensure that he's not calling the shots, he's not influencing things, he's not the one actually making it happen, she is. He's just making it clear that he is totally open to what he knows she wants. So she is more willing to accept what she wants, and that leads to her embracing it. Then, then when Garak calls her on it, that is now Garak going against Kira, not Sisko going against Kira. Very nice play there. Um, 
So <laughs> there's also a, a quick thing. I, I already kind of discussed Intendant Kira's character back in the last episode, but they continue her characterization. No, no arc here, but she does have continued characterization here in the form of how she talks to Smiley. And the way she doesn't say this, but what she is saying or what she's implying is, I grew to love you. And that wasn't enough for you. What's wrong with you? Like, how could anyone want something more than my affection? The true sign of an actual self-interested narcissistic person. So, Cisco's method of interrogating Jennifer was actually quite brilliant as well. When I say interrogating, I mean he was getting information out of her about his the other Cisco by basically saying very vague things that don't really mean much and allowing her to fill in the gaps as part of her outrage. What's also funny, though, is, and this credit to Avery Brooks, because he's basically playing two and a half characters in, the, in this whole episode. He plays Cisco, he plays Captain Cisco, which he's already played, but during his scene with Jennifer, he plays Captain Cisco melting back into Cisco, and it's a nice gradual shift. He does a really good job of it, and a really good job pro uh, portraying that kind of as he loses the mask and as he loses his facade, and just Cisco, our Cisco, just starts to shine more and more. And you'll notice, of course, that's what convinces her, seeing someone actually charismatic, actually decent, actually genuine, who really does believe in this cause. Which brings up my next point. I almost wish they'd shown more of it, but it feels to me like our Cisco, Cisco, really does legitimately believe in the cause of the Terran Rebellion. And it's not hard to see why. Uh, Cisco is always the kind of person, and this will become even more true in the future, who pretty much puts his morality first. Like, he has duty and responsibility and all that, but those are all, like, number two and three and four. His sense of morality, his sense of right or wrong, is at the very forefront of his mind. And even though he doesn't want to interfere, and even though it's an external matter, blah, 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 he still cares, and he still legitimately believes in the cause of the rebellion and trying to usurp this. And again, it's not hard to see why the, the alliance is horrific bad. <laughs> you know, again, stupid evil. It's not hard to wish for people to no longer be under the oppression of stupid evil, whether they are your people or not. And so his, his passion and his, his, his strength and, and the sincerity with which he tries to discuss and, and convince Jennifer to his side is, is very legitimate and very real, and I think that's what really gets her attention. And, of course, informs her that he's not Cisco. Again, the one of the three women he's, he's close to who figures it out is the one he stops portraying the character for. So I suppose that makes sense, Regar regardless of the whole... I know it's not a word. Uh, you know, I, we were married and know each other trope, which seems to be uh, present. So then they escape. I feel so bad for Rom in that. That's really horrible. I absolutely love the way he outmaneuvers them, though. They're all just standing there. Now, I have to admit, when I first saw this, my first thought was holodeck, you know, projection, something like that. And they're actually hiding out over there or whatever. Oh, we're dead. No. And then we escape in the quietly. But no. Setting the station self-destruct because he has the command codes, that's brilliant. Except for one thing. Why are the station command override codes the same? I, I, I cannot express... For anybody who doesn't understand computer design or software development or security or anything, or has ever worked as a white hat, let me just say very simply, the odds of two completely separate parallel realities having the same station built with the same command codes, it's one of those approaching zero things. The odds of that are approaching zero. or The, ch the ch chance of that being re real. Again, crafty universe. Anyways. But it's still worth it because, yeah, I set the self-destruct code, and she's like, that's ridiculous. And you can see, again, credit to Nana Visitor. She has a good job of portraying Kira, like... Like, you could just see her s mentally stumble. And then she's like, okay, no, I've, I've got I've got this. It'll be cool, it'll be cool. Station. And she she's all swagger when she says, cancel self-destruct. And then almost kind of like, ah, she then she has to input the command code, which is, of course, the exact same one he just mentioned. And she kind of loses her smile and loses her swagger a little bit as she mentions the command code. And then the station's like, nope. And he just kind of looks at her and says, I changed them. And then she walks up to him. It's like, you... You, well, um, 
And Garrick's like, he's bluffing! And she's like, no, he's not. <laughs> I kind of like the idea that this Kira either knows Cisco well enough, or, and I like this better, is good enough at reading people to see that Cisco is absolutely not bluffing. And indeed, he wasn't. <laughs> so they get out. She thanks him for rescuing her. And I just gotta say, I actually wish this had more impact in the future. I know this sounds so strange, but as usual, I wish there was more continuity in Star Trek, and especially in Deep Space Nine, which is weird, because it's one of the most continuity shows we've got. Like, uh, DS9, uh, Enterprise, Late Enterprise, and Discovery are like the most continuity we've ever gotten in Star Trek. But it, it still feels like it's not enough, because this should have had impact. Benjamin Sisko, our Sisko, Commander Sisko, rescued Jennifer. That should mean something to him. That should have some kind of long-standing impact to him. I would have loved it if she, to use a parallel, gave him a flute, right? Like, that's it's one of the things TNG did very right. They didn't do a lot of in-your-face continuity or string continuity, but Picard had that flute for many, many episodes after that incident, right? It would have been great if Jennifer had given him something as a reminder or a memorabilia or something to in, as, as a thank you here, this, you know, this was our wedding ring, right? Hear me out, because then what if she actually still had the wedding ring and gave it to him as a thank you for rescuing her? And then what if from now on, up until a certain episode when another character enters the show, you know what I'm talking about, some of you have seen this series already, he's just wearing that ring. Maybe on his wedding finger, maybe not. Probably not. Uh, for example, it would probably only fit on the pinky because, you know, smaller fingers. But, you know, something like that as a way to showcase how the continuing impact of this. Because then when other people show up on the show, it could be a thing. You could call back to that ring as he considers what he's going to do with it and how, you know, maybe you should... be like, what's that? Uh, nothing, you know. You could have done something with that. Instead, this will never have impact ever again. So, <laughs> whatever. I still enjoyed the episode as much as I could for being a Mirror Universe episode. I hope you enjoyed. We'll see you next time.